Welcome to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. This podcast is brought to you by SavingYouTaxes.com and hosted by J. Barry Watts. As an advanced tax strategist and enrolled agent federally licensed by the IRS, Barry is uniquely qualified to go deeper into the Internal Revenue Code than most accountants. He understands and interprets its provisions explaining how they'll help you reduce income taxes you owe so you can direct that previously wasted tax money into tax-free accounts that you can enjoy in your retirement years. Now, on today's episode. Hello and welcome to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. I'm Barry Watts, your host. Professionally, I'm a retirement designer and tax strategist. I'm in the 27th year of a career in which I've worked as a certified financial planner, founded a brokerage firm trading on the New York Stock Exchange, the NICE, as they like to call it, and other exchanges. And I've been the CEO of a publicly traded company. I'm even admitted to represent clients before the Internal Revenue Service. So those are some of the things that I do and have done and have been a part of what brings me to today, being able to kind of coach you on some of the things we're going to talk about in the podcast. Now, my co-host on the podcast today, who also works alongside me in our tax strategy and retirement design firm is Eric Burleson, who has just returned from a long exile in session with the state legislature (laughs) of Missouri. That's one way to put it. Where he serves as a state senator. Welcome back, Eric. It's great to be back. We're glad you're here today, and we're going to have a lot of fun on the podcast. I think this could be the greatest podcast we've ever done. I think so too. So the reason it's going to be great, we're going to focus on the retirement part of the truth about taxes and retirement. Specifically, we're going to talk about how risk impacts your retirement. Now, you could yawn and kind of say, I don't think this is going to be a good one. I don't necessarily want to listen. And uh, you could scroll on past this to something else. But don't do that. Don't touch that dial. Because we're going to talk about some things that are really important that I think are really helpful And you need to understand these things because they really zero in on impacting your retirement. So let's start first with risk and what the definition of risk is. Now, first, you got to realize, well, what kind of risk are you talking about? For example, there's tax rate risk. And that's uh, the risk that tax rates, of course, are going to go up and eat your profits before the money comes to you. And then there's inflation risk. And that's, of course, that the cost of living is going to go up. Which is happening a lot right now. (laughs) Well, it is. We're in a season for that. Are there other kinds of risks you can think of, Eric? Well, there's there's health risk or there's lots of different kinds of risks. Yeah, yeah, there certainly are. So the point is market risk, we have to identify which kind of risk we're talking about. And market risk or investment risk is the kind of risk that we're talking about today. So Eric, why don't you explain to us what investment risk is? Investment risk is basically the chance that your return will be, could be less than you expected or that you intended your investment to, to, return. So if you had intended, for example, your investment return to be say 5%, but instead it actually yielded a return of negative seven, you lost some of your principal and that's investment risk. Indeed. Investment risk is I was expecting one thing. I got another thing. And the thing I got was less than what I had anticipated, or in the worst case, it was negative. Negative is really where we think that risk really kicks in. So there's another term that's closely uh, related to risk, and that term is volatility. Now, volatility is the change in price in the value of an investment or a portfolio of investments. And so if the investments experience large price fluctuations, lots of up and then lots of down, swinging big up top of the mountain, fall down, far down to the bottom of the valley, we generally think of that kind of investment as having more risk in it because there's a chance that the price of the investment or the value of the portfolio will fluctuate down simultaneous to when you need to cash out and withdraw part of the investment and therefore you'd lose your principal. Yeah, that, you know. That volatility term, uh, when I was in college, our professors had us memorize beta mm-hmm. and the, the formulas for the beta coefficients. I was in the beta club when I was in high school, but why don't you tell me what the beta coefficient is? So it's basically an indication of the volatility of an investment. Yeah. And in the investment management process, the S&P 500 is given the standard beta of one. 
Right. So if a portfolio had a beta of 1.2, that means it's 20% more, more risky than, than the S&P 500. That's right. exactly right. Because volatility and risk are, while technically not exactly the same thing, they're very closely related to each other and tied together. Now, I want to help you understand why volatility and risk matters. And here's exactly why. When an account or an investment goes down in value, even as a part of a normal fluctuation cycle, if you lost value, then when the account increases in value, it has to climb out of the hole to get back to ground level. And that eats up time that you could have been earning and getting in ahead, but instead you were busy just trying to get back to even. For example, let's go back 20 years ago when Eric was just a wee lad, uh, <laughs> graduating college and just kind of getting started. When I first started plugging away into my 401k. And, okay, we're right in the middle of this whole mess. So in year, the year 2000, 2001, 2002, the S&P 500 lost 49.1% over a period of 929 days. That's two and a half years. So the S&P 500, starting with Y2K, that's what we called it then. The beginning of 2000, the S&P 500 started down and it went down for 929 days, two and a half years. And when it finally got to the bottom and began to climb back out the other side, it took 48 months. That's exactly four years for the market to get back to where it was when it started going down back in 2000. So this means that from 2000 to 2007, the S&P 500 produced zero. Zero. It went way down and then it climbed back up. But when it got back to where it started, the market had spent seven years going in the hole and coming back to zero, seven years that were lost. And no sooner did the market get back to ground level in 2007 than in October of 2007, the market started going down again. And it dropped this time by a total of almost 57%. Now, it took 517 days to do that. It took 1.4 years for the market to drop back down into the valley. And then it started climbing back out and began to recover. And it took 37 months, a little over three years, to climb back to ground level, all total from peak to trough. It took four and a half years. That's four and a half years when the S&P 500 didn't earn any money. Right. If, if you had had it static from that first period to, to the end. Yeah, if you just put it in in, in, 2000, in 2000 and then wrote it for that period of time. So here's what we're saying. The S&P 500 started down in 2000, reached a bottom in 2002, climbed back to ground level in 2007, started immediately going back down again, hit a bottom in 2009, climbed back out to ground level, and it took 2013 for it to get back to ground level. So in 13 years, an account invested in the S&P 500, and by the way, most 401k and IRA accounts are truly invested very similarly to the S&P 500. So for 13 long years, people didn't earn any money. Yes. Now I want you to think about how long 13 years is. How long is a career? Well, any more. <laughs> <laughs> Bad question. Bad. You know, <laughs> back in the day, people would work at a company for decades, but well, now it's maybe just a few years. Yeah, but your working career, let's talk about a person's working career. Let's right. say it's going to be 50 years long, okay? Right. So a half of a working career would be, help me with the math, because I come from a place where we're math challenged. <laughs> 50 years, uh, half years. of that would be 25 years. Right. So and then is, half of that would be 12, 12 and a half, half years. So this is basically a quarter of a person's career. A quarter of your working lifetime, your money didn't work at all. Right. Now it looked like it did because it because if people were plugging away into their 401k during that period of time and because of dollar cost averaging they it would have appeared like their account was growing. So people didn't know this happened because their account statements were showing larger over that period of time and those people were busy and they weren't paying a lot of attention necessarily. And no one ever pointed out to them what had happened because if you're a stockbroker or an investment person, you wouldn't really want to bring up the fact that you hadn't really done anything helpful for your client in 13 years. So people just missed out on what was happening and they missed any growth during that period of 13 years when there was zero growth. 
Now, folks were putting more money into their accounts, and so their accounts were growing larger. But as the account was growing up in value because they were contributing money to it, those same people were busy raising kids and mowing the grass and taking care of aging parents and right. being members of PTA. And they never stopped to pay attention to what was really happening in their accounts, which was nothing. Their accounts weren't growing except for the money that they were putting into the account. Which is really a question, and this could be on another podcast, but the question is what was happening in America during those 13 years that caused us to not grow? That is another podcast of a whole different topic. <laughs> <laughs> so here's something I want you to think about, Eric, uh, when it comes to risk, volatility, and loss. There is something that's called the arithmetic of loss. And to understand it, I want you to do some math in your head, okay? So if you're mathematically challenged, brush off your brain cells, and here we go. Pretend that you have $100. Now, let's say you lost 50%. How much would you have left? There's your test question. Oh, man, $50. You're going to have 50 bucks left, right? So you lost 50%. Now you have 50 bucks left. It's pretty simple. Now, if you want your 50 bucks to get back to $100, because you only have 50 bucks to work with, what percentage do you have to earn to get back to $100? Yeah, some people think it's 50%, but it's not. What is it? It's 100%. If your $100 went to $50 and you lost 50%. Right. If you only gained 50% back, because people think, well, I got to make back my 50%. Wait, if you only make 50% back, then you're only going to have $75. Right. You've got to make 100% back. So the point is a 50% loss requires a 100% gain to make up for it. Your money has to double to get back to where it was. And this is why I teach in the class that I teach over at Missouri State University and other places. This is why I teach people that losing hurts worse than gaining helps. And it's so easy to lose and it's so hard to gain and dig your way out. And it takes a lot longer. In fact, Bank America did a study that I read about just recently. And in their study, they said it takes 1,100 trading days. You know, trading days are Monday through Friday if there's no holidays. 1,100 trading days to regain what is lost in a typical bear market. There are 252 trading days in a year. So it takes 4.4 years for an account to climb out of the typical hole that it dug itself. And that's why losses hurt so badly. You spend most of your investment life trying to get back to where you started. And it's why most people retire and take out of their 401k very little more than they have actually put into it over the years. They are unwittingly and unknowingly Spending all those years losing ground, then digging out of the hole, coming back to ground level, only to sink into yet another stock market hole. And Eric, I got to tell you, people work too hard for their money to allow this to happen. Absolutely. They can't let their money be lazy like that. They can't allow their money to sit around. It ought to work the other way around. Your money should work hard so that you can take it easy. And that's really how retirement is supposed to work. Your money works hard so that you don't have to. Yeah. You know, that when it comes to losses, you know, one of, some of the, one of the most famous investors, Warren Buffett, he, he has quoted as saying, the number one rule in investing is don't lose money. Yeah. Number one rule. And if you can get that down, then, then the rest is a little bit easier. Well, it reminds me of the oath that doctors take. You remember the Hippocratic Oath? What's right. the main line that we're told is in the Hippocratic yeah, do Oath? Do no remember? harm. Yeah, first, do no harm. First, right. do no harm. And that's kind of the approach to portfolio management is first, do no harm. Don't set it up for losses. And so in order to do that, we have to understand what risk is. We have to understand how risk works. We have to understand how much risk is in a portfolio. And we have to find a way to quantify risk. And so I really want to help you begin understanding how we might quantify risk and what we can do about risk and loss. Now, there are some really strong, powerful things that we can do to protect ourselves and to protect our investments and our portfolio from loss. And many people don't believe that. And the reason they believe that you can't protect yourself against loss is because they don't know the facts. They've been taught 
that losing is just part of investing and that you can't avoid risk and loss. And while it's true that investing always involves some measure of risk, and that means you could lose your money, there are things you can do to help yourself. And we're going to talk in this podcast and in the next one about what those things are. And so here's where we like to start. First of all, we need to quantify how much risk is acceptable to you personally. And the way we do this is we start by thinking about driving your car. Okay, so let's just get in the car in our minds and start driving down the road and think about it. Now, if you drive your car at one mile an hour, how much risk is there that you'll have an accident? Not much. And if you do have an accident at one mile an hour, I have to stop and say, well, were you not paying attention or what? But if you do have an accident at one mile an hour, how much damage will be inflicted on your car and your body? A lot less than it could be. Not very much at one mile an hour. I mean, that won't set off your airbags. Trust me, I've hit things at that rate. Right. And if I need expertise, I go ask my youngest daughter and she fills me in with the other details, but mm -hmm. I shouldn't have said that. But in the case she could listens to the podcast, she'll appreciate unless that. Unless something else hits you. Yeah. Well, if something else hits you, that could be different. But you're right. Let's, what about, let's change it on the other end of the scale. Let's say you're driving your car at 100 miles an hour. And first, let's have a little time of confession. Eric, have you ever driven a car at 100 miles an hour? No comment. <laughs> I guess in your esteemed elected position, that might be important information not to be out there. You know, I was thinking about my answer to that question. I don't think I've ever driven 100 miles an hour. I know I've seen 90 and maybe 92 or three or something like that. I don't think I've ever hit 100 miles an hour, but 90 miles is too fast anyway, unless you're like out in Wyoming on those big, wide, I, long, straight I roads. I find that as cars have become more advanced and more precise better engineered it it's amazing how much faster you can find yourself going you know and not even realize it here's the laugh for you you know the vehicle i drive the fastest in is my big long ford f-250 pickup truck with my 30 foot gooseneck stock trailer hooked on behind it because it's got all the weight of that trailer coming down on all four tires on the the ford pickup and baby when you put a load of cattle in the back of that thing it runs smooth really down the road. it's amazing i can find myself at 90 miles an hour and just didn't even know it was happening. I think we're off topic, but <laughs> I was having but, a little trip there for just a minute. But to your point, the faster you go, the, the more risk of being hurt. At a hundred miles an hour, you don't have time to respond. You don't have time to correct or dodge a pothole or avoid a collision. It happens before you can respond to it. And if it happens, how bad is it going to be? Well, at a hundred miles an hour, it's going to be really bad. You're right. going to tear up a lot of stuff right. on your vehicle and probably on your body. Right. But the benefit is that you're going 100 miles an hour. Well, I guess. <laughs> I'll have to get think there, about that. Get there Berman. faster. So the way we rate risk is from one mile an hour to 100 miles an hour. And we can actually take a portfolio and we can run that portfolio through a mathematical, statistical, algorithmic, computerized process. Wow, that sounded sophisticated, didn't it? That will take, uh, take all the fluctuations in price over time on all the investments in that portfolio. And then we can tell you how much risk expressed in miles per hour is in that portfolio. For example, the S&P 500 has a risk score about, of about 75. So we can nail down how much risk is in the S&P 500 or the Dow Jones Industrial Average or your personal portfolio, your 401k that's got all the different mutual funds in it and so forth. We can tell you, hey, your portfolio has got a risk of 82 or a risk of 71 or whatever it is. You get a specific evaluation that will show you not only your risk number, but it will show you how that portfolio performs when the market goes up or down, what you can expect to gain or lose in risk in that portfolio, we can do what's called stress testing it. And we'll say, well, let's pretend that this exact portfolio you, you have now goes back to 2008 and 2009, has to go through that experience again. How is it going to perform? And it's really insightful for people to right. see this information because they don't know. Right. And so if, you, if your portfolio has, for example, a risk score that's above 75 miles per hour, then you should be expecting better returns than the S&P 500. Well, that is the point. That is the point. Because you've taken on more risk. That's the point. But I'm going to tell you that's a little bit old information because we've got this process dialed in so tightly today that we have portfolios that outperform that that only have risk down in the 40s range. 
And that's really the whole point here. We need to know how much risk is in a given portfolio at any time. And we need to ask ourselves, is there a way I can maintain my performance or even increase the performance, right. but reduce the risk in the process? Which to drop another investment term is alpha. Yeah. yeah. It is getting a better result than given the same level of risk or... You do know, though, that none of our listeners are Greek, so they don't know <laughs> alpha or beta by and large. Right. I'm just grieving you over that. Yeah, alpha is a technical term that we use in the industry that investment people toss around. And what that means is how much additional performance are you getting for the level of risk that you're taking? Exactly. So a, alpha and beta and delta, all these are different terms that we use in the investment management process. Now, Eric, let's go back and talk about this portfolio idea. So we can evaluate a portfolio. We can see how much risk is in the portfolio, how much performance is in that portfolio, how that portfolio responds to certain times when we stress test the portfolio. And we can even take it one step further, buddy. We have a series of questions that we ask you over a period of about 10 minutes that will help to identify the amount of risk that is acceptable for you. For example, at the end of this set of questions, it would say your risk score is, and it gives you a number. For example, my risk score is 85, and that's pretty fast. That's really pretty risky. But this is what I do for a living. It feels okay to me because I understand the markets and I know how to respond to them, both professionally, but also personally and emotionally. Now, I know, Eric, your risk score is higher than mine. What's your risk score? 95. You had a risk score of 95. Yeah, that's kind of insane. That's too fast, young man. You need to slow down. <laughs> <laughs> so but, it makes sense that your risk score would be higher than mine. Right. Because? Well, I've got a little bit more time. Yeah, that's a nice Possibly. way of saying that. You, you, in, in you, years you were work. elegant about that. You're a politician, <laughs> aren't you? Notice how smoothly he came out with that. So what Eric was saying was, I'm older than he is. So it makes sense that he would not have the, or he would not have the aversion to risk that I might have. Now I've got a client whose risk score was in the sixties and she sold her business and she came in to talk about what to do with her money. We spent a lot of time talking about risk. And when we were done with that meeting, you know what? She wanted a portfolio that was in the thirties, even though she had a risk score in the sixties. I had another client who was in just this week, who's 70 years old. His risk score was 96, one higher than yours. Wow. Yeah. And I said to him, Hey, look, dude, about this risk score. What do you think? Don't you think 70 years old and 96 risk is a little high? And he said, Oh yeah, that doesn't seem quite right to me. I said, you won't be offended if I invest your money more conservatively. He said, no, no, I won't be offended if you do that. So the point <laughs> is this gives us a way to talk about risk, to know what your risk appetite is. I've got another client I know who's going to be coming in in a week or so who her risk is in the thirties. And yet the portfolio that she's bringing in had a risk score in the 80s. And why? Well, because somebody else was managing the investment. She doesn't know how to think about risk. They told her these were good things. And we're in a booming time in the market where everything goes up, 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 up. And everybody's fine. But you know what Warren Buffett had to say about that, don't you? Right. What? He said, right? No. What did he say? Tell me. When every, well, it, the, when the tide come goes out, that's when you realize who's swimming naked. That's exactly right. And at some point, this the tide, tide is going to go out. Right. And when this tide goes out, we do get to see that these portfolios that had so much risk in them, oh my goodness, are loaded up and they are full of trouble. So the point is, your portfolio as it is invested has a risk number. And in most cases, that risk number is higher than you think. And you have a personal risk number that works for you, an amount of risk that is acceptable. And knowing these two numbers helps us to evaluate whether you have the proper portfolio and whether you should adjust your portfolio to match the risk score to one that is acceptable for you. Now, here's why you should do this. Remember, go back to the beginning. It takes 100% gain to make up for a 50% loss. So we don't want to lose if we can avoid it. It takes 4.4 years on average to dig out of a hole that's created when the stock market goes down. And we don't want to waste our investment years losing money and digging a hole and then climbing back out of that hole to get back to even. And so the solution is to understand risk, evaluate risk, and protect against risk. Now, in today's podcast, we've done two of those. We've talked about understanding risk and its impact and how we can evaluate it. And in the next podcast, I'm going to talk about how to protect against risk. And in order to get you ready for that, I want to make you an offer. 
If you would like to take advantage of uh, this offer here on the truth about taxes and retirement, we're going to make you that offer that you'd just be silly to refuse. Uh, we're going to offer you a free risk analysis to help you determine your personal appetite for risk. You'll just simply send us an email and you'll request this risk assessment. We'll email you back a link that will take you to a risk questionnaire that you can complete online in about 10 minutes. And it'll ask you questions like how much could you lose over the next six months and still be comfortable. And it'll give you some options to pick what your loss that you would tolerate would be. And in the end, it's going to come up with a risk number for you. And then it's going to ask you, does this risk number seem right to you? And if it does, great. And if it doesn't, then you can go back and modify some of your answers in order to get the risk number to what you think is the right number for you. And once that's done, you can stop simply knowing your risk number. Or if you're interested in an analysis on your existing portfolio to see what the risk is on the portfolio, well, then we'd be happy to talk with you about what's involved to get that risk analysis done. But some people like to just know what their risk number is so they know how to think about how they want to invest their money. So if you're interested and you'd like to get that personal free risk analysis done, all you have to do is send an email. Send it to office at savingyoutaxes.com, office at savingyoutaxes.com, and just say in the email, I'd like a personal risk analysis like Barry talked about on the podcast. And we'll reply back to you with a link that you can click and it'll take you to the risk analysis tool. And in just a few short minutes, you'll know what your personal risk score is. Meanwhile, if there's anything else that you'd like to talk with us about, anything related to taxes or retirement, you can reach out to us through our website, savingyoutaxes.com, where you can grab a telephone number or send an email and one of our team members will be back in touch with you. And there on the website, you can also click the green button in the upper right-hand corner of the screen. It'll take you to a listing of all of our podcasts. And I hope while you're there that you'll subscribe to the podcast. And if this particular podcast has been helpful to you, I hope that you'll go down to the bottom of your screen and click share and send it to a friend who might be helped as well. Now, on the next episode of the podcast, we're going to talk about how to protect your investments from risk, the specific blocking and tackling steps that we take to protect from and mitigate risk. But until then, on behalf of SavingYouTaxes.com, I'm so glad you joined us here on The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. I'm Barry Watts, your host, and I normally end the podcast by saying, if you don't get the taxes right, nothing else matters. But I'm going to change it up today and simply say, if you don't understand and learn to protect against risk, then nothing else matters. I'll see you soon on the next edition of The Truth About Taxes and Retirement. Thank you for listening to The Truth About Taxes and Retirement podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. The information covered and posted represents the views and opinions of the guests and does not necessarily represent the views or opinions of SavingYouTaxes.com. The content has been made available for informational and educational purposes only and is not intended to be a substitute for professional tax and investment advice. Always seek the advice of your own qualified advisor with any questions you may have regarding taxes and investing.